Hi, everybody. My name is Joan Viscardi. Welcome back to this episode of This TV. It is really a pleasure today to have on Anna Jimenez, who is a birth worker and also a language justice practitioner. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. This year, Viscardi has been focusing on mental wellness and wellness in the workplace. We have had on many really inspiring guests who have talked about what it is that they do to maintain their own wellness at the workplace, how they bring home uh, their work and still maintain mental wellness. And it's a hot topic in society now, which I think is good, but I really want to talk to you about First, your work. Can you tell the listeners, what is a birth worker? Um, a birth worker is someone who can support anyone who is um, trying to conceive um, and any point from there till their postpartum period. Um, and they provide physical, emotional, and spiritual support. Birth work is uh, seen as a spectrum and can begin from preconception, so providing emotional, physical, and spiritual support um, for someone who is trying to conceive um, until the end of their pregnancy, up until however many weeks or even months postpartum. Um, and it is um, something. It is the kind of work that takes a lot of patience and empathy and understanding and really love for um, all people that you serve. Um, I specifically focus on queer families of the global majority, um, which means um, people of color, or black and brown indigenous people. And, um, yeah, that's that's where I have, as a part of the community, I have found um, that the need is is there. So it's interesting. As a nurse, we had. I'm going to segue back and forth. Um, as a nurse, we're trained a certain way, and it's need. It's need that really drives what I, as a nurse, assess and what I assess I need need to do for my client, my patient, um, the individual person that I'm working with, um, the things that you mentioned require a lot of your own physical energy, I would assume, and a lot of mental energy. You know, you know I know medicine in and of itself, we, int we introduce you to a lot of people in different spectrums, different industries. But it's interesting when I talk to people who are in healthcare, you know, healthcare practitioners of any sort, um, they really come at it with, my client has a need, just as you said, and I am providing this service. So how do you provide a service, understanding the need, but also your own needs, if that makes sense? How do you go into caring for someone else? What do you have to do for yourself first? I see birth work as a part of the way that I take care of myself. Um, that's part of my practice. I cannot foreseeably be of aid to anyone if I haven't gathered the resources that I need um, and you know made sure that I've had my meals throughout the day or I've taken my vitamins or I've taken um, the necessary water intake or that I've had a piece of fruit. Um, I, I wanna make sure that before I show up for anyone, I've shown up for myself. Um, you have to be your main priority when you're taking care of other people. It's the only way you're going to be successful in a line of work where you are taking care of um, not just a load of, of you know, paperwork, but also physically um, the needs of, of, some, of someone else. It's, it's, it's a beautiful experience um, to be able to witness life emerge for the first time 
And what's rewarding is having the privilege to provide very basic needs um, to someone in hopes that that service will continue, um, not just through communicating it, but through example. Um, my hope is whether I'm working with a single parent or a couple or, you know, a, a family of 12 in, you know, a three bedroom apartment in New York City, like I, I want people to know that acts of kindness really do matter. And, um, and I see myself doing that a lot in this practice is the, oh, it's been an hour since you've had anything to drink. Like, let me get you a glass of water um, or what's your favorite tea? Um, it's making sure that that parent or that family doesn't have to worry about where their next meal is gonna come from. Um, it's about reaching out in a mutual aid sort of way where, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back, um, maybe not today, but tomorrow, um, that I will be able to fundraise certain resources, whether they be um, financial support or clothing or diapers or, you know, whatever it may be that I take that responsibility off of that family and be able to show them what tools they already have at the tip of their fingers. Um, again, it's a privilege to, to provide that need, um, you know, as small as a, as a meal, which could really gain you so much sustenance and really in, in, for the day is not very small um, to, you know, financial support that could cover six months of rent. And maybe for the first six months postpartum, someone isn't, doesn't have to worry about, you know, whether they um, have to call off of work because they've realized that three to six weeks postpartum isn't enough time to recover because it isn't. And, um, so being, be, again, just being able to find those resources, allocate those resources and do so in an informative way um, is something that is very rewarding and so much so if, if, if it, ha it has longevity to it. Wow. So you're not just a birth worker. I, th I think the name as it associates with the work you do you're not just doing birth work, you're doing community work. You're facilitating, from what I'm hearing, you're really facilitating this individual having a healthy process and postpartum helping facilitate services. That has to be, as you just said, rewarding, but it also has to be draining. So how do you, Anna, mm -hmm. take care of yourself during this process? How do you wake up in the morning or you're already at the home and you've been there for maybe three weeks. How do you take care of yourself during this process and keep it rewarding? Keep, keep yeah. this whole entire experience rewarding. Well, when, when I'm in it, like if, when I'm in a birth or in a home um, where I'm providing postpartum care, I've from personal experience know that biting off more than you can chew is too much. Um, I have already experienced burnout in, in this work um, in ways that could have totally been prevented. Um, you know, it's like I'm, I'm prepping four different meals that will last, you know, a, two weeks and I do not think to serve myself a bowl. Um, and this is a, you know, 16 hour long day where I have maybe had uh, a protein bar. So hopefully what I've learned and don't have to relearn over and over again is that again, I cannot take care of 
someone else if I haven't taken care of myself. So dutifully really um, scheduling my needs and prioritizing the, those um, and seeing what an ideal work schedule for birth work um, correlates with my physiology, um, my mental well-being, um, my my therapy appointments. Um, you know, all of all of these um, really luxuries because uh, unfortunately, um, you know, wellness is not not to categorize therapy as wellness, um, meaning, you know, wellness in this day and age has been a very uh, clicky kind of term where, um, you know, going out and doing your yoga and then your brunch with, you know, your people. And then after that, going and having your facials and, you know, all these like transparent ways of what wellness is that that doesn't really serve the greater public. You know, it, it definitely doesn't serve um, my 66 year old mother who has, I believe, unfortunately never truly rested or has felt well in a very long time. What tools do you use to keep yourself well? Making sure that my, my life schedule does align with my work schedule. Um, so that work never is never prioritized over my myself and my wellness. Um, and that I also I also clearly see the intersectionality of my work and um, how I should be taking care of myself. Um, a lot of the tools that I use in order to take care of someone, physically are a lot of the tools that I've used to take care of myself, a lot of the tools that have been passed down to me by my great-grandmother and my grandmother. Um, so this is very, I believe, to be wise and um, intentional, mm -hmm. intuitive, and um, sometimes very difficult to explain knowledge because um, I think the beauty of what true wellness can be or is, is um, the acknowledgement that we, we are all, um, we're all deserving of taking care of ourselves and having the time to take care of ourselves. Um, time is a luxury no. under, under these systems. Um, <laughs> we know that, but you, you've focused, you know, you, your two key words that I really wanna jump on are intuitive and intentional. I don't know, I know with myself, wellness has to be with intent. It's not, in. It, it is not intuitive to, for me to take care of myself. It is intuitive for me to take care of others. Mm -hmm. I have to intentionally really focus on myself where I find it easier to focus on others. And it's interesting that some of the healthcare workers that we've talked to kind of talk about it, but that's really, um, I think really key for our listeners to understand the intention and the intuitiveness that if we don't have the intuition on how to care for ourselves, we have to intentionally think about how to then get those tools to do it. Yeah, and sometimes we aren't able to take care of ourselves in the very basic ways. Um, yeah, but, but you, have, you have to, in your work, really look to how to do that for yourself. You know, you really have to intentionally say to yourself, as you just used an example earlier, if I'm going to prepare meals, I have to eat. 
you know, I, I have to, I always found it really interesting and I can't help have the picture in my mind with you talking. I always found it interesting that on an airplane, when, before you fly, the warnings come up, the, the little clip notes, the little movie video demonstration on if such and such happens, you have to put oxygen on yourself first before you take care of your child. And I think that's basically what I'm seeing as you're talking is you have to be, really take care of yourself in order to really take care of other people. Do you think passion equals wellness? I think passion is such a beautiful emotion to emote. It, it truly is. It can be the drive to anything. Um, but drive only takes you so far. So of course I'm I'm passionate. I'm passionate about putting these hands on on you know on a person who who needs them. I'm 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 grateful for these hands that prepare medicine, whether it's food or topically. Um, but passion doesn't sustain me, and passion can really drive me to do the maximum and give myself the bare minimum if there's anything left. Um, and although you do need to have love for what you do to some extent, um, I think you also need to be very strategic because again, that's the only way that you can truly be in service to anyone. I think martyrdom is um, antiquated. We don't need it. Um, um, I think that we are all deserving of rest. Um, and it's a and, balance. I think and it is. And it's, balance. and it's, and it's a, and it's a balance. If you could give me three tricks of your trade to keep you well, what would they be? Um, laugh a lot because life's a stage. Um, and truly find joy in the little things and get some vitamin D. Those are great. Those are great. <laughs> I can't, I can't say they've been shared with us before. And I think <laughs> our listeners can easily get some vitamin D if they can't in capsule form, they can sit outside and take in those rays, even though we're coming to the fall. Um, there are still some rays to be found. The little joy, I think, is so important for everybody. I don't think it's always easy, but I think it's really important. And um, life is sage. You know? So I thank you, Anna, very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me.